Good morning, Burl Press members and good morning, Burl Press friends. We welcome you this morning on this last Sunday of July to this worship service. Today we have an incredible offering, and yet we also have to say that we are beginning a bit of a tricky subject as a congregation and as a community. So have a little prayer right now with me as we begin this service. Lord, be with us as we talk about the subject of race in our congregation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The good news, however, is that we have had our youth and our young families begin this conversation this last week during a Zoom chat in which there were over 40 people who attended this in a a talk called How to Talk to Your Child About Race. Well done to our youth, to our next-gen team. And we just want to say a special hello to those who led it, this wonderful couple who come to us from Long Beach, California, and that is Jared and Shauna Wilkins and their son. Thank you so much for leading that conversation. Today also we have an interview with one of our pillar members, a man you know so well named Roger Astasi, and he will talk a little bit about some of the difficulties of being an immigrant and being of immigrants who have come to America. Finally, I just want to warn you to get a box of tissues ready right now because you will hear a solo and a duet from one of our incredible singers, Jess Cates, and she and Brian Whitten will sing on Eagle's Wings. My friends, today you are in for a treat. So let's begin our worship service as we always do. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. have an incredible worship team here at Burl Press. Thank you once again for bringing us into God's presence. Will you pray with me? Ever-present God, you have created and called us to be in relationship with you and with one another. You have promised that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are. In the midst of them we gather here in your name in our community we are many different people we come from many different places we have many different cultures and we have many different kinds of experiences 
open our hearts that we may be bold in finding the riches of understanding, inclusion, and the treasure of diversity among us and in our larger community. You are the God of life, the God of hope, the God of all. Lift us in your love like eagles' wings. Teach us, sustain us, guide us, heal us. Then send us forth into your diverse world that we may love all as you love. For you are our God, you sent your Son to us, and we pray in his name in the way in which he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Roger, thanks for agreeing to come and be with us this morning and share a little bit about your life and your history as it relates to the um, topic for his sermon this morning. So as I understand, you were born in Lebanon and came to the U.S. as a teenager, and uh, your family were actually Christian refugees and immigrated to the U.S. under Egyptian passports. So I'm wondering, have you ever felt cultural oppression in your life? Yeah, hi, good morning. Thank you, Jane. When my dad uh, uh, sought to leave Lebanon for better opportunities in 1963, we came under the sponsorship of the World Council of Churches based as Christian refugees, and uh, we moved to San Mateo County. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started college at uh, the College of San Mateo, a brand new campus on top of the hill then. And um, I, I observed the uh, uh, of uh, uh, observations that uh, um, uh, the misunderstanding between cultures. So one, one apparent form of, um, of mistrust maybe, or some, it could be oppression, Iranian hostage crisis in November 79 to 1981. I was in downtown San Mateo driving my car and I was stopped by a group of angry mm -hmm. teenagers. They were yelling at me, and they surrounded my car, cursing me and, let, and telling me in more than a way to go back to Iran. So uh, I almost got out of the car to start a fight with them, but fortunately, I, my logic prevailed, and I stayed in the car and just drove away. The reason you and I even got started talking about this in the first place was because you had sent an email asking for prayers for uh, your uncle's family since he had died at the age of 98. And, you know, not even knowing who he was, that he had served five U.S. presidents, um, you know, with Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon and Ford. You know, I had no clue. My response back to you was simply that having lived 98 years, he probably had a lot of stories to tell. Curious to know, what do you think your uncle would say to us? Um, as we look around the world today, what do you think he would share in terms of wisdom or counsel or cautions for us? And uh, I wanted to speak about the meal uh, left me because this is a, a way it trips my tribute to his life. Uh, uh, Camille came from Lebanon uh, in 1948. He moved 
the United States, began, uh, began his graduate studies in the United States. And he sought a better life. Lebanon was uh, going through uh, uh, a pretty uh, tough period economically, and there was no way for gifted people to have any real advancement in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So he moved here, and uh, a few years later, when he completed his graduate studies, he was able to get a job in the State Department as an uh, announcer and broadcaster for the Voice of America in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, he was interviewed for a job to be the State Department Arabic White House interpreter. So his role as an interpreter was an observer. Uh, he, of course, he couldn't have any influence any political decisions during the, a lot of the secretive talks that took over. So, uh, as an example, he was uh, uh, interpreting uh, the peace, uh, uh, the meetings between Arab leaders. A lot of them had to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict. Mm -hmm. And during the first round, or the first thoughts of the United States getting involved in an Israeli-Arab peace accord, uh, my uncle Camille uh, was actually uh, doing the shuttle diplo di diplomacy trips with Henry Kissinger, who was the Secretary of State back under President Nixon in uh, early 1974. The lessons I would, I would have learned from Michael Camille is that uh, bigotry and misunderstanding actually clouds the vision of people who are hosting immigrants or hosting refugees. And the, the, the impression is false, and it's, it's not based on any, any factual, uh, factual uh, uh, reasons. So uh, we, uh, and I'm speaking as a Lebanese American, um, and guilty as well, we try to shield ourselves from outside uh, influences. Uh, we want to protect ourselves from, from people who are not like us. Mm -hmm. and. I believe historically that was true as well during the Irish, Italian, Asian, and other migrations to the, to the United States. I hope that in our conversation today, uh, you feel like you've been able to, you know, kind of honor his memory because we did want to hold him up um, as a, you know, as an example of someone who did uh, choose to seek a new life here in the United States, but then also was significantly invested, as I said, in, in the peace process and working towards kind of reconciliation in his home country as well. So thanks for sharing some time with us this morning. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. It's been delightful. Thank you. Friends, again, welcome to worship. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. Let's do an active prayer now. We're just going to speak the words, grace and peace. You can say that to your family where you are now, grace and peace. You can grab your phone and text a loved one or a member of the congregation those words, grace and peace. And if you are by yourself where you are right now, know this, we are the church and you are not alone. Grace and peace. Again, church, my name is Dan Ciappelloni. I just want to take this opportunity again to welcome you to our worship service today. Wherever you might find yourself, we are so glad that you have made your way here. Even during this time, we are still able to support many ministries in our church. We've got our next gen ministry, worship ministry, we've got adult ministries that are happening, along with many others. And it's all in thanks to your support that we are able to keep doing so. And one of those ways that we are so thankful that you show your support is through your financial gifts and offerings. We as the church wouldn't be able to function without that. And so from the bottom of our hearts, we really do thank you for that. There's a few ways that you can give. You can text us at 84321 followed by a dollar amount. 
You can also go online to burlpress.org slash giving, or you can write us a check and you can mail it into the church. We thank you so much for your support, and I would now invite you into this time of offering and your gifts to God. I warned you, I warned you, was that not a tearjerker from Jess Cates and Brian Witten? Thank you for their incredible talents, and we will hear a lot more from them in the future. We also thank Roger and Jane for that wonderful conversation, talking about Roger's uncle who has passed away working with presidents of the United States. And even as high as Roger's uncle got in the White House of America, even his family dealt with challenges related to race. And so we see that even at the highest levels, it's difficult. 
But we welcome you once again today. We say hello to our friends in Santa Barbara, California. Thank you for joining us. We pray the Holy Spirit is with you, even as we sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, right here, right back here in the youth lounge at Burl Press. You know, there's an old saying, which is, all good things come to an end. And yes, today is the end of our Songs of Summer series. For the last seven weeks, we have dug deeply into this incredibly rich book called the Book of Psalms in our Songs of Summer. And I've so appreciated so many of the emails you have sent us and text messages. This from one of our regular attenders in Napa, California, writes me this last week, I just love the Book of Psalms. The best thing through all of this is that I read and I have been reading the whole Bible that you gave me every morning first thing. I enjoy the messages to start my day. I just, it wouldn't trade it for anything. God bless you all. So we thank you to our friends in Napa, California for that text. Just to recap where we have gone in this series, and I always like to do that whenever we end a series. We began seven weeks ago when our own Pastor Jane began us with a psalm and a wonderful sermon on the topic of holding it all together. And she preached from that amazing psalm, Psalm 16. The next week, if you can remember, was graduation Sunday or move up Sunday. And there we heard Psalm 71, and we saw that God is with us at every generation and at every stage of our lives. The next Sunday, seems like a long summer, and it has been, was Father's Day weekend. If you remember, I began, I think, by sitting down with my fedora, but we have a message that day about how much our Father loves us. Our Father in heaven, that is, loves us. The next Sunday was Confirmation Sunday, and we should just give God thanks for the fact that 10 or so of our young people became members of this church during this COVID crisis. And that was the time that I preached that message from Tucson, Arizona, right there at the foothills of the Tucson Mountains. By the way, what I forgot to say in that message is that Tucson is the same latitude as Jerusalem on a map. And so that was what the hills of Jerusalem looked like. The next Sunday, we had a wonderful sermon from Pastor Jane on the topic of being still or be still on Psalm 46. And then the week after, another remarkable sermon from our own Dr. Beth, who preached on the only person who really knows us in our lives is God. And she preached Psalm 139. And then last week from my own living room, I preached from Psalm 27. And I reflected with all of us that as we are doing church in our houses now, our houses actually need to become houses of God. And so I encourage you to find a secret or a sacred or a sacral space in your own homes. So today we're going to close out our message series on Psalms. And as you've already heard alluded to, we are going to take on a tricky, tough, sticky, challenging, and sometimes a bit divisive topic today on the topic of race and the race reconciliation that needs to happen in our country today. A couple of things I want to just say as we begin this, we really want this to be the beginning of a church conversation, a church conversation. And that means a, a bilateral, multi-way, multi-directional conversation. So even though I am beginning this conversation today, I will be spending the rest of my time, the rest of this year, listening to many of you. And by the way, if you want to have a long and in-depth conversation with anybody today, just ask them what their thoughts about race are. I did this with several members of the church this last week, and two hours later, we were still talking about race. Everybody has an opinion about race and the current moment that we're in. The second thing I want to lift up is that I will not be leading this conversation on my own, but that two incredible elders, one by the name of Rodrigo Salas and the other by the name of Rubik Dereshodian, will be helping to lead our congregation in this conversation this next year. And they welcome anybody in this church who wants to be a part or to help lead that conversation to do so. The next thing I want to say is that good for you, for many of you who have taken the 21-day race equity challenge. 
that you have committed to learn as much as you can about some of these topics that most of us, myself included, just do not know enough about. And as we have continued with our race conversations with our students and also with our service of lament, we will try to continue to engage you in those kinds of learning opportunities. The last thing I want to offer before we go into our message is that there probably is not a more divisive and contentious issue in the United States today and ever than the topic of race. And the last thing I want to do as pastor is to be a part of another divisive or confrontational or a contentious conversation that causes schism in any way. So I just want you to know my commitment to be a part of this conversation, to listen, and to, to all of us pray that, that God will not let this issue divide us. Just to give you an idea, I have an editing team that looks at my messages every week, and I would say about half of them are conservative and the other half are more progressive, and both of them gave me great ideas about today's message, and I value both sides of that conversation. But as we head into today, I want to begin with, I think, a fairly important point if we are to move forward in our conversation about race. And that is that while I feel that a lot of incredible things are happening at this moment in U.S. history, that one thing that might be lacking is a pastoral voice, a religious voice, a voice that focuses on, on Christian love. And so today, that is my theme. And we pray that this also meets you with Christian love. But let's pray. God in heaven, you are the God of all people. Everyone who has ever been made has been made in your image. People of all different cultures, all different races, all different creeds, all people have been made in your image, and you love all people with all of your heart. Be with us as a congregation as we begin this conversation about how we can better love all of your people with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, in 1935, a small group of African-American intellectuals were trying to figure out how to move the United States forward on racial issues similar to the ones that we're facing now. And so one of the great black intellectuals, William E. B. Du Bois, and others, Howard Thurman, started to study this enigmatic leader and movement that was happening in a faraway country called India. Now, none of these people had ever been to India before. Some of them would have even had a hard time finding Delhi or Calcutta on a map, and yet they wanted to go and study from a man by the name of Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Mahatma Gandhi was not Mahatma Gandhi at that point. He was just an enigmatic and brave person who was trying to bring India into the land of independence against the British Raj, British imperialism. So this group of black Christians, I must underline Christians, headed to the country of India. And there they met with none other than Mahatma Gandhi. I just want to lift up an amazing quote that I found in one of the remarkable biographies about Martin Luther King, that there in that room, Howard Thurman and several other black intellectuals, in addition to a black Christian choir, all met. And what uh, is said in one of the great books, What Manner of a Man by Lee Roan Bennett. For several minutes, Gandhi and his guests discussed Christianity oppression, and love. Then, unexpectedly, Gandhi asked the American black choir who had come along on the trip to sing one of his favorite songs. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Now, I just want us to imagine the scene for a moment. The choir gathers and they stand, they stand up front there and they reach deep into their hearts and they begin, were you there? When they crucified my Lord, were you there when they nailed him to a tree? Oh, 
sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? After he finished, that choir finished, the room, it is said, was totally silent. And there Gandhi sat for a moment And it said the old sad words rose and swelled like a benediction, like a curse, like a prayer. The more terrible, the more poignant, perhaps, for the strange setting. When at last the song was done, Gandhi sat for a moment in silence and said, Perhaps it will be through the black Christian church that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world. Which leads me to my first point, and I've made it in several other messages, and that is that most of the great movements in social history and social change in modern history have begun with a handful of Christians, just a handful of Christians whose souls are heavy with the burdens of the oppressed people and whose hearts were on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. The world has been changed by handfuls of people who committed themselves to the oppressed people around them, and because of their love of Jesus Christ, they changed the world. Now, many of us know the rest of the story for India, that in 1947, Gandhi, and again, let's remember, this is between 1935 and 1947, it would take over 10 years for India to become independent from Great Britain. It was hard, it was backbreaking, it was brutal at times, and all through this powerful concept of nonviolence. Now, we will talk a little more about this later in the message, but the power of nonviolence or a nonviolent movement is the idea is that you have the power to change the other person that you are engaging with through not being aggressive towards that other person. It's totally counterintuitive. And yes, my friends, it's also a Christian concept. So let's move now to the United States. In 1958, things were not going so well in the United States when it came to race issues. Segregation in the South, there were separate water fountains for black people and white people. There were separate restaurants. There were separate eating counters. There were separate buses for black people and white people. There were police beatings. There were fire hoses in the streets. There was segregation of all kinds. There were lynchings. It was not going well in the United States. Enter a man by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, When you think of Martin Luther King Jr., you are thinking of the man who has his name on most avenues in the United States, Martin Luther King Boulevard, or on many of the elementary schools around our country, or who has an incredible monument to Dr. King. But back in 1958, Dr. King was not MLK. No, Dr. King was just a normal pastor in a normal congregation just like this one. And he was loving being a pastor. He was at a church in a place called Montgomery, Alabama, and he was serving the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. King loved being a pastor of a small, middle-sized church. He'd go to church cookouts. He'd have cocktail parties. He would go out and play football with kids. He loved being a pastor. And yet... He also felt that there was this movement in the South, particularly the Deep South, involving race, and he wondered in his heart, should he, should he get involved? Should he leave his cush little job at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, and should he join these protest marches? Some of them were violent marches. Should he, should he get his hands dirty? Should he, should he get a little messy? Should he, should he get a little dirty in this conversation about race? Should he, should he even be bothered? Should he leave behind his easy life of being a pastor and enter this difficult conversation about race? These questions were surrounding and swirling in Dr. King's mind and heart. And I say that because I bet when I say that, that you are having a similar dilemma. You are wondering, as Christians, as members of World Press, 
how involved should we get in this current moment? How involved should we get in this race conversation? How, how messy should this congregation get as we move into this very difficult and divisive topic? God was working on Martin's heart. Now, I have a very special treat for you. I have the honor of reading a letter that, to my knowledge, has never been read in any sermon ever before. I have the honor of reading a letter that I don't believe has ever been published in any major book. And this letter is from none other than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., written with his secretary from the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in 1958. Now, I love old documents, so I just want to show you. You'll see up on the screen this incredible document that you can see was, was typed by a secretary. There's still an ink stain on the bottom of it. It is an incredible letter typed on a Smith and Corona typewriter. And I need to hasten to add that this letter is from Kim Engelman, who many of you know who has preached and taught in this church. And Kim Engelman's great uncle was president of the Garrett Theological Seminary in Evanston, Illinois. And he was trying to recruit Martin Luther King to come and become a professor. So I'm going to read to you a letter that has never been read publicly in any kind of forum like this from Martin Luther King himself. Now, what I want you to listen for is the tension in, in King's heart. Should he become a professor, an easy profession back then in some ways today? Or should he get involved in this new social movement involving race? So let me read to you from this letter that will also be on the screen in front of you. It begins this way, August 5th, 1958. Dear Dr. Loader, for several months now, I have prayerfully and seriously thought through your offer to serve on the faculty of Garrett Biblical Institute. As I said to you before, there has been something of a pendulum swinging in my mind between an affirmative answer on the one hand and a negative answer on the other. There have been moments, says King, that I found myself saying, this is just the thing for me. I came out of seminary, says King, with a strong desire to enter the teaching professor, profession. He always wanted to be a professor. Here was his chance. And even though I have fallen in love with the pastorate, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, I am sure that this desire still lingers subware in the subconscious of my mind. Isn't it fascinating to get into the heart of Dr. King right before he enters into the civil rights movement? Next paragraph. I know, however, that it would be very unfair for me to keep you waiting while my mind goes through this constant alteration, to enter, to not enter, to get involved, to not get involved. So, says King, I feel a moral obligation to share with you the decision that I have presently made. As you know, he says, I am deeply entrenched in the rising tide of racial conflict here in the Deep South. And they look to me, said King, to guide them spiritually and otherwise as they move with uncertainty through this maze of racial tension. Does that not just sound like July the 26th of 2020? Yes, 62 years later, it feels like we are still in the maze of racial tension. Now, this is a beautiful part I want to make sure to read before I close this section on the letter. I have a deep sense of responsibility at this point and feel for the next few years at least that my place is here in the deep south. In other words, he had an easy out, but he decided to roll up his sleeves and get involved, doing all in my power to alleviate the tensions that exist between, and I'm going to use the word Negro here because he does, even though I wouldn't in the current context, between Negro and white citizens. I have started on this challenging venture of love and nonviolence. Now, again, this would be the heart of Dr. King's theology, his doctrine. And I just want to spend a couple of moments talking about what it means because it has actually helped me in my life deal with all manner of situations I'm in. See, Dr. King believed that there are three responses 
to any kind of aggression that comes to us. Three responses. And so put it in your own context. An, a mean email you get, somebody yells at you, maybe you've dealt with some kind of physical or emotional abuse. There's three ways to deal with aggressive people towards you. The first said king is to be passive. Let them roll over you. Let them take advantage of you and let them take advantage of you again. And King said, never do that. Never let people just roll on over you. The second option said, King, is to meet aggression with aggression, to meet violence with violence. And many would say that this is actually the just way, that that's the just way, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And you would remember that King, or Gandhi would later say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth makes the whole world blind. Dr. King would agree with that. And he would say that the big problem with violence against violence is that it inflames the violence that's happening. And more importantly, it minimizes the potential of changing the other person. And that leads us to the third and the best option in terms of dealing with aggression. And King said, you meet it with non-violence, with non-aggression. In other words, you stand up, you stand up for what you believe, but you do not meet aggression with aggression. You meet aggression with love. Christian love, and Dr. King actually used the Greek word agape, sacrificial love. Now, King believed that that's the only way to change a system, is to meet a system of violence or aggression or oppression with love. It is a dangerous theology, as we would later find out from Dr. King, who would give his life for this cause. And yet, as we have found through the years, and Jesus himself would say on the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, when somebody slaps you on one cheek, what should you do? You turn the other cheek. Jesus was also speaking about nonviolent response here. Jesus wasn't saying be passive, roll over, let people take advantage of you. No, he said the strongest thing to do is to say, hit me here, hit me again. Because, said Jesus, and Gandhi, and King, that's what changes the other person. Now, I know that this is controversial, and I want to be real careful here, and I want to stay out of politics, but I believe that Dr. King would be appalled by some of the violence that he is seeing in the streets of America today, some of the violence that is being demonstrated in some of these protests, and I need to underline only some of the protests. Most of the protests have, in fact, been like Dr. King's protests. They have been nonviolent protests. And Dr. King would have been appalled at some of the violence that he is seeing from law enforcement agents and from policemen. He would be appalled, and he would also be appalled and saddened by some of the violence that's happening in our inner cities and even though we need to be careful about not making this too simplistic, it's a terribly complex topic, he believed that the best way to change a system is to have a nonviolent reaction against it. And if you ever watch some of the old tapes of Dr. King, who is walking in these protest marches, you will notice that King walked super slowly. No one ever walked more slowly than Dr. King, said one biography that I read of him. He walked slowly. In a way, it was a protest. It was like, I'm going to walk all day here, and I'm going to take my time in nonviolent aggression. And we should remember that this last week or so, one of our great lions of the civil rights movement, our own John Lewis, passed into heaven. And the thing to remember about Lewis and I worked on the Hill for a while. I can't say I ever got a chance to meet Lewis in person, but I knew of him as he was always trying to bring people together. Republicans and Democrats, people of color with uh, people who are uh, more Caucasian in, in skin tone. One of his great quotes is, we are one people with one family. We all live in the same house and through books, through information, we must find a way to say to people that we must lay down the burden of hate. For hate is too heavy a burden to bear. God bless you, John Lewis. Now, I would be remiss if I just didn't read the last sentence of this letter, which brings a tear to my eye just to read it. 
Again, this is before Dr. King would get into the civil rights movement. He would become the figurehead of the civil rights movement itself. And he writes to Dr. Loader, I ask the prayers of all the folk at Garrett Theological Seminary in the search of the true Christian solution to this sometimes heartbreaking problem of race. Sincerely yours, signed simply and beautifully, Martin. Ten years later, ten years to the day, on April the 4th, 1968, Dr. King would give his life for this cause. He was always pushing the bounds of safety. He'd be at the front of those protest marches and his advisors said, you know, Dr. King, why, why don't you walk behind everyone else? It's a little safer, but he always wanted to go up front. And you remember James Earl Ray, an escaped convict from a Missouri penitentiary would shoot him dead, an assassin's bullet. He would die at the young age of 38. I tell you this narrative because for some people, this is new information about the wonderful history in our country about race and those who have laid down their lives for it. I tell you it also because I know a little tiny bit of what it is to stand up against the powers of racism, sometimes in churches, and to find that those powers are powerful. But I also lift this up to lift up this image of nonviolence and to ask you, where are you in this process of thinking about race? And to remember this, this is my second point in my message, that only God, only God can lead a human heart to take up issues of race and reconciliation. Only God can change hearts. And I just need to underline that as we begin this conversation. Only God can do this. No sermon from me can do it. No new curriculum can do it. No browbeating and no, no forceful tactics can force another person to change their heart. Only God can change human hearts. Now, I don't know where your heart is today, but I've had the chance to talk to about five or six of you this last week and just ask you your heart on this issue. And some of you have given me some very helpful answers. One uh, member of this congregation said, you know, I, I just sort of feel like I'm being pressured into this conversation on race. And what I want you to know as lead pastors, I will never pressure you into any kind of conversation about Jesus, about baptism. I am a no pressure approach pastor. Neither will Rodrigo or Rubik or any of our staff. We will not pressure you on this conversation. Another person told me that, you know, I can go along with some of the ideas I'm seeing in this protest movement, but I can't go along with all of it. And I want you to know I hear you. I hear you. I see some things coming out, some ideas that I could just say I don't think are good ideas. Now, I know I'm wading into politics here, but I just don't think that defunding the police is a good idea. In most cases, unless there is some egregious forms of oppression and racism in a particular police department. But that's my opinion. So I can't go along with all of the ideas that are coming out of this protest march. But my friends, I can go with a whole lot of them. I can. Because I want you to know they, they break my heart. They break my heart. I mean, when I hear about poverty in this country, that people who live in poverty, it is 8.1% of people who are in white families and 20.8% of people who are in black families who live in poverty that is below the poverty line. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I find out that those who have died of this COVID disease 13, only 13% are people who are white, and 23% of the people in this country who have died of the disease are black. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I watch a video of, of a police officer in Minneapolis who for eight minutes and 46 seconds holds a man down and nobody did anything. 
Nobody pushed that police officer over, not any of the fellow cops. It breaks my heart. And I know a lot of you. And I know that some of these issues break your heart too. And so as we enter this conversation, we're entering it with broken hearts for the people that God loves. And I also want you to know that as a pastor, I have witnessed again and again and again the power of God to change human hearts that I never thought could ever change. I've seen it again and again. I knew of this one grandma once who was a good friend of mine, and she had this daughter who was also a part of the church, and her daughter married a man of African-American cultural descent. Now, that grandma, she never really said a whole lot, but I could tell, and her family could tell that, you know, she, she just wasn't all that comfortable with it. It was heartbreaking for the family for many years, and yet, as I saw God continue to work on this grandma's heart, I saw God change her heart such that all of those wonderful grandchildren from different cultural backgrounds and different hues and skin tones became her favorite grandkids. And my friends, only God could do that. And so as we begin this conversation, we're asking for God to do something big in all of our hearts. Now, how does God do that? Lots of ways, through messages, through prayer, but also through scripture. And as we close this psalm series, I want to read for you what I think is one of the most powerful psalms in the Bible. It's not that all of them aren't powerful, but but this one's got some super strong power to change hearts. It is Psalm 91. This psalm was a part of the Benedictine uh, codes at nighttime during prayer. This psalm can be found on sarcophagi throughout Europe. This song was sung over a dying patient not too long ago as she headed into heaven. This psalm, this song, Psalm 91, was recited when a Rwandan warlord was trying to attack a woman of a Rwandan tribe, and she read this psalm alive, and she stayed alive through that terrible massacre. Now, I just want to say that, you know, if you don't want your heart changed today, you don't have to listen to the rest of this message or this psalm. You don't. One of the wonders of modern technology is you can fast forward this message to the end of the message. Just just click a little further down the screen. Go to the next hymn. You're going to love it. Or just click the red button. You know, seriously, seriously, this may not be the right time for you. But if, if you want God to do something for your heart, I want to read for you as I close today one of the most powerful psalms in the Bible. Listen for God's word, Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart, and you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not Come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, 
I will rescue him and I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with a long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So what's happening in your heart? I personally feel like my heart is being changed. But now it's time for me to sit down and to listen. God in heaven, thank you for your power and your might. Thank you for Dr. King, who courageously followed you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, we just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy week to spend church with us today. And on behalf of our staff, we just want to say that we miss you, we love you, and if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Now next week, I am so excited because we're going to be kicking off a brand new series called Holy Trinity. And our very own Pastor Jane Doty McKenzie is going to be teaching us on week one of the series. She's going to be teaching from Genesis 1, John 1, and Colossians 1. So we encourage you guys to read those scriptures in order to prepare your hearts for what she has planned next Sunday. Next Sunday, we also have the awesome opportunity to celebrate communion together. And so I just want to leave you with this last blessing, and that's this. Our God that is so omnipresent, that is with us every single day of our lives. May this week we had the eyes to see his presence, and may we feel him closer than our very breath. Today and forevermore. Amen.